Good afternoon and uh, welcome to everybody. I'm Markus Engerhardt from German Historical Institute in Rome. And I have the great honor and the pleasure to welcome you here and outside at the computers to section three of the conference Music and Power in the long 19th century organized by the Academia Musicale Chigiana in Siena. This uh, section entitled Imperialism, Colonialism, Decolonization deals with the oppression of peoples and cultures under the sign uh, of imperialism. It asks how music has given expression, has compensated uh, the loss of freedom through political oppression, the loss of cultural identity. The first of four examples comes from the opera, an opera by Meyerbeer. Hardly any other opera composer has devoted himself to the problem of musical dramatization of collective fates under the sign of ideological and religious conflicts in a comparable way as Meyerbeer. We look forward to the lecture by Kate Driscoll from Colorado. So a slave in chain to a tyrant, are you not still a sovereign? Captive cartographies of race and empire in Meyerbeer's Vasco de Gamo, please. Thank, Thank you, you very, very, very much, for Professor, Professor Engelhardt, um, um, for that kind of as, well as, as well as for generous our panel today. Our panel. My sincere thanks extend to the organizing committee and Comitato Scientifico of this wonderful conference, as well as to the Academia Kijana for hosting us. You've gathered a fascinating series of discussions, presentations, and performances. And I'm extremely grateful and humbled to be contributing this afternoon, even from afar in the very mountainous Colorado. My humility in offering the remarks I've prepared for today stems primarily from my academic positionality as a literary scholar and cultural historian of pre 19th century Italy. I'm thus delighted by the opportunity to be in dialogue with the many experts of a field and time period to which my own research has recently brought me. The literary lens in particular through which I'll be situating my comments today about opera, colonialism, reception, and historiography will focus especially on the genre of epic for reasons that I hope will become clear throughout my discussion. I'll say here at the beginning that the larger project in which this work participates is a transhistorical study of the interactions between epic and empire on both stages and pages alike between the early 17th and mid 19th centuries. At the heart of this work are representations of expansionism, conquest and collective global history present in classical and Renaissance epic, which shaped the development, production and circulation of historical operas produced in Italy and France. The project thus takes theoretical interest in ideas surrounding social cosmopolitanism, polit political collectivism, and the making of comparative world history, ideas that motivate Epic's agenda to narrate the foundations of a political community, while also essential to the pre-national history of the operatic medium. My remarks today will briefly trace how questions of epic and empire in tandem with critiques of colonialism, gender violence, religious intolerance, and slavery evolved on the global stage, both real and imagined. Maya Bea's posthumously staged Vasco da Gama or L'Africaine, as it was titled in performance, is under investigation today for its juxtaposition of the alien and the familiar, conveying their interconnectivity in ways that historically challenged the categorical differences propelled by emergent separatist notions of national belonging, uniform patria, and a homogenous political body notions that often called upon the legacies and justifications of epic to advance their appeal. While epic and opera have been identified as national art forms insofar as a central importance to their creation and reception lies in their service as foundational narratives, whether to canons or to artistic traditions, 
My interests rest in how such mediums mapped cultural mobility within and often in resistance to the patriotic fervor and religious reform that swept across Italy, France, Europe, and their occupied territories from the late 16th to the mid 19th centuries. As aesthetic exercises in world making, epic and opera coordinate elaborate networks of itinerant diplomats from the traveling strangers of transnational fiction from Homer to Tasso to the many hands that make worlds, nations, and empires textually, visibly, and acoustically possible in performance. Power relations and their attendant complexities, the topic of this very conference, lie at the heart of the political matter that gives shape to both literature and to performance. If epic poetry has often been understood as a discursive allegorization of the twin projects of nationalism and empire, a principle located in the foundational comparative scholarship by David Quint, opera and its reception of history shared in a similar mission to represent political communities, both singular and collective. From its origins in the 16th century, opera has engaged in many of the same reflexive relationships as epic poetry regarding social and political transformations based on military, religious, and colonial histories. If Anthony Welch has shown that, quote, in opera, the epic tradition returned to an oral idiom, end quote, in which the narrating poet sings literally and as trope, i.e. canto, a series of follow-up questions concerning the political engagement of these two art forms deserves to be asked. One, how might Epic's attention to documenting a shared home, community, and existence have informed operas often intertwining national and imperialistic agendas, especially during periods of sustained global contact and colonial discovery? Two, as a creative imaginative practice, how might opera's reception of at once Epic poetry and the history of global conquest participate in, in and steer revisionist historiography? Three, what narratives of cultural superiority and dominance are challenged by epics and operas joint critiques of the imperialist project? And four, what oppositions pertinent to the histories of racial and ethnic categorization, slavery and the, and the commodification of strangers, domination and subordination between the sexes, and the mobile embassies of church and state play out on the operatic stage when it is reimagined as a colony? Ascribing literary agency to the ep operatic epic-based libretto as a unique example of artistic creation and not a narrow mode of tedious imitation grants this form the power to narrate, to echo, to echo Edward Said, as well as the ability to represent what Benedict Anderson referred to as horizontal comradeship through the theatrical depiction of hybrid societies on stage. My underlying interest in the dialogue between epic and opera lies in each medium's critiques and transcendence of the hierarchical binaries that underscore Eurocentric approaches to cross-cultural encounters. This work th thus brings the study of literary and performance history into conversation with Mary Louise Pratt's notion of contact zones in which the operatic stage emerges as a site for the hybrid representations of race, religion, polylingualism, and cultural multiplicity. If we contextualize poets, historians, musicians, composers, and opera intellectuals as multicultural ambassadors who design sets and stages not always as emblems of national and imperial pride, we can read musical theatrical spaces as complex sites for the multi-layered invoicing of collective identities and interconnected global histories. By disentangling opera from the nationalistic context that have long surrounded it, and through bringing attention once more to its so-called obligation to epic, a literary focus on this art form demonstrates that the libretti born from epic subject matter preserve the overlapping representations of multiculturalism, polylingualism, cross-confessional exchange, and hospitality for, as well as tolerance of, religious, gendered, and racialized otherness. These questions, I believe, are raised to a more pressing state when we consider the role reception occupies in not only replacing but displacing national histories as they evolve across art, power, politics, and borders. Eco Willis's critical framing of reception as a, quote, context activated practice brings into relief how the actors of reception activate the production, transmission, distribution, and circulation of messages. The emphasis here on reception as a force of active transformation strongly resonates in the evolutionary potential of an empire's national heritage. 
excuse me, of one in the evolutionary potential of one nation's history to appear on the stages of another. If narrative accounts of an empire's national heritage, in today's case, Portugal, can be translated for and colonized by later forms of imperial rule, that is France, to what degree, degree does Vasco or even opera more generally enact its translatio imperi for historical and contemporary audiences? Methodologically, what runs as a current throughout this paper is a commitment to take quite seriously the epistemological and imaginative work that opera conducts in the historical production and circulation of information about the globe and its inhabitants. This commitment, to be clear, recognizes the many caveats and causes for caution inherent in any style of listening that would insist too firmly and narrowly upon opera's capacity and perhaps to its willingness to encapsulate or imitate history. In seeking to join interdisciplinary scholars about how the early modern world and its 19th century reception came to know and recognize themselves, I, a literary scholar trained in early modern studies and following the lead of multicultural opera historians, many of whom are present at this conference, and who have set the tone for contextualizing opera within transhistorical and transnational sociopolitical discourses. Such critical designs have yielded considerable influence upon my understanding of opera as an instrument of political diplomacy, a theme so perceptively addressed in the work by Mark Everest on opera and empire, and one which serves to as much to entertain audiences as it does to culturally mediate the information to which it exposes them. And now to the case study itself. Named for the Portuguese seafarer who connected the Atlantic and Indian oceans, Vasco da Gama or La Friquen demonstrates how comparative approaches to collective global history evolved on the aporotic stage, while even while navigating various forms of intersecting and often contradicting power structures. Such ideations of politics in performance debate questions of slavery, gendered hierarchies, racial and ethnic categorization, and the itinerant embassies of church and state embodied in the opera under the single institution of the Portuguese Inquisition. Based in part on episodes from Comoixa the Lusiads, published in Lisbon in 1572, the opera's complex reimagination of da Gama's voyage critiques and transcends the hierarchical binaries that underscore Eurocentric approaches to cross-cultural encounters, a likely result of the geographic the geographical transposition of the epic from the Mediterranean Sea to the Indian Ocean. The opera's portrayal of hybrid personalities, for example, slave queen, pilot poet, and captive captain, reveals how the cartographic imaginary of colonial power develops at the crossroads of transnationally negotiated identities, both on and off stage. African voices subject to foreign captivity harmonize with the concerns of anti-authoritarian Europeans. Such polyphonic criticisms against common bodies of power obscure the line between history and fiction, records of the colonizer and of the colonized. The fictional debates posited in Kamoisha's epic and Mayabe's opera that give light to comparative approaches to global history resonate in critical reflections on Eurocentrism's tendency to quote, sanitize Western history while patronizing and even demonizing the non-West. The relationality of power and the power of relationality, which lie at the core of the making and unmaking of history, are as potent in the Portuguese epic as they are in the French opera. In both cases, idealized versions of history, the chronicles of champions who are awarded representation as such, are challenged by figures who resist double colonization at the discursive and performative levels. Historically for Portugal, Camoixa's epic heralding the nation's bold expeditions and novel discoveries appeared in print just before the nation's image as a transoceanic powerhouse began to wane. Following the defeat of King Sebastian by the Northern African military troops in Morocco at the so-called Battle of the Three Kings, the kingdom was subsumed by Spain's Philip II, who initiated a 60-year hold on the Portuguese nation, incorporating it into the so-called Iberian Union. The anticipatory nostalgia for Portuguese history thus present in the Lusiads bring, provided a compelling framework upon which to build and reimagine a Portugal for French audiences. My interest in reading the French libretto as a receptive vehicle of Portuguese epic 
has less to do with matters of real-time Parisian audience reactions to the opera, reactions no doubt liberated from a particular constraint to be familiar with Portuguese history or its literary canon, and more to do simply with the very practice of intermedial reception and its attendant opportunities to reimagine both texts and histories alike. Such creative function in the transformation of text, history, and media appears resonant with Sarah Hibbert's study of opera's capacity to, quote, bring the past alive. The undeniably diluted influence, to recall Nicholas White's words, of literature onto the French grand opera libretto does not inherently negate a comparative approach to investigating how reception mobilizes revision. It is the creative space of the historical imaginary that gave life both to Camoysia's epic and to Maivet's opera, and it is this space that is worthy of our attention. Even if, to recall Jean Andrews, among opera-going patrons, quote, contextual knowledge became secondary to emotional response, end quote, a process of knowledge transfer whereby cultural imaginaries blended and were born anew, nevertheless took place. The presence of Renaissance history on the collaborative stage of Maya Bell and Sklebe's artistic efforts had experienced great success in the decades leading up to the premiere of the Vasco opera. The history of 16th century religious conflicts represented at the heart of their earlier collaborations depicted a world absorbed in a rapidly changing political climate, whereby competing orders of authoritarian state and theocratic rule challenged one another for dominance, just as the size of the world part of which was being renamed as new, expanded exponentially. The three decades spent working on their final collaboration brought the composer and the librettist to realize the blending of history and myth on stage, a relatively recent past in European colonial history whose painful effects, namely the exploitation of land, peoples, and resources, were still being experienced well into the 19th century. While operas based on the age of exploration achieved wide popularity during the 17th and 18th centuries, especially those dedicated to Aztec and Spanish subjects, operatic interest in the Portuguese maritime expeditions was certainly more limited. Still, resonant across nearly all musical theatrical productions based on episodes from the age of exploration were exotic encounters with human difference, often registered according to European standards along the separating lines between the civilized and the uncivilized, indications of what Said would refer to as positional superiority. Such categories had been at the heart of fierce debates already widespread in the mid 16th century regarding the inherent rights of all individuals, Christian and non alike, as well as the contested authority and justification of European expansionism itself. In this instance, it serves simply to recall the treatises written by Bartolomé de las Casas that recount the atrocities of the Spanish empire inflicted upon indigenous American populations. And thus, even as the ideology that drove expansionism insisted upon the diffusion, encoding, and enforcing of sameness, the erasure of the exotic, that is the outside via its incorporation into an empire, perceived human difference and the chaos its realization generated remained a difficult barrier to overcome. These and other similar themes emerge in perhaps more subtle ways in the Vasco opera, but their articulation ought not to go overlooked. Vasco's obsession with having discovered along his Indian travels a race sans connu, or unknown race, suggests an eagerness to, to exploit the cultural capital embodied in foreign novelty. And yet, no stable categorization of the terms foreign or unknown is traceable in the opera. Such a principle re reveals itself early on when in Act I, Scene Two, it is Don Pedro who will be the first to refer to Vasco, a European, as a member of the gens Enconnu, unknown peoples, simply because of his lowly status as Bartolomé Diaz's naval companion. Whether unknown through contact or through reputation, figures in the opera, both European and non, are subject to foreignization through the power of perspective. Although the decidedly oriental figures of the opera, the two slaves, Celica and Melusco, are featured with indications of their foreign appeal and wild energy, their so-called energy sauvage, the shifting sands of the opera's setting, acts one and two in Lisbon and four and five on an island in the Indian Ocean, lend way to a developing understanding of cultural relativity. Foreignness as a token of identification and tolerance as its socially determined measurement travel in the opera just as far as wide as do the ships of discovery that land upon distant shores. Still, 
The composer had a particular portrait of the figure of the Eastern female in, rhyme, in mind. While writing to Scleave regarding how he wanted his Indian queen to appear in the opera, Maya Bant specified her distinctly non-European characteristics. She must be made more a woman of her warm climate and painted with less European manners. Along with her innate virtues, she must be given the impetuosity and jealousy that the burning climate of her homeland inspires in the passions. Such elision between human behavioral traits and the influences of geographical climate bespeak a, familiar, a familiarity and ostensibly an agreement with the longstanding prejudices that gave shape to the myth of biological races, whereby hot climates were imagined to impact individuals' cognitive, sexual, and occupational behaviors. Meyerbeer continued to remark that the continual combat between the impetuosity of her oriental blood and her ingenuous love will furnish in me the musical colors to design her role. It is thus not only the case that Selika is oriental, but that her identity as such will play an authorial hand at the opera's very com composition. To elaborate on her amorous affections, the sentiments she demonstrates towards Vasco participate in the contradiction identified by music critics as the soldier and the exotic, the contradiction between the desire to escape from the world one belongs to and the belief that one's nature is inescapably bound up with one's people. Inherent in the opera's imbalanced attempt at equal love is the political hierarchy of the colonizer and the colonized, the Western hero of Christian curiosity turned colonization, and the Eastern subject forced to bend to occupied rule. Contributing to the complexity of the opera's representation of power structures is Selika's status as a slave queen, a figure removed from power in order to serve those who have since seized it. The liminal space between empowered and impoverished is that which Selika embodies. Her proximity to power is accentuated by her displaced positionality from it. Such tension is accentuated by Nelusco's attempt to remind her of her native origins and loyalty to her people. Though she may first in, appear in the opera in chains, Nelusco implores her to remember that she is still a sovereign, charged with the responsibility to protect those over whom she rules, even if it means defying those who currently claim rule over her. Thus he insists, queen, keep the faith of your oaths. A slave, a tyrant has fastened to his chain. To be in chains, though, are you no longer sovereign? Although in the artist's correspondence, we see exaggerated attention to the oriental qualities of this Eastern woman, the opera goes not to great lengths to fetishize her foreign appeal. She is not, de she is not decorated with praise for her darker complexion, her enchanting beauty or striking exoticism. Rather, since colonial and sexual exploitation do not overlap in this work, more emphasis is placed on the key diplomatic intervention Salika carries out. She rescues Vasco from harm on more than one occasion on both the European continent and within her native land. Such notable departure from the traditional means of representing conquered female bodies is not to be discredited. In the iconographic tradition, encounters between Western and indigenous peoples had long since employed tones of eroticism to convey layered examples of conquest that mapped territorial victories onto sexual triumphs. One famous example to recall in this instance is the depiction by Johannes Stradanus of the encounter between Amerigo Vespucci and the figure America, which was included in the Nova di Perta print series of 1600. The appeal of foreign untouched Terra Nuova emerges in Stradonis's continental personification, a sexualized nearly naked young woman who reclines before the European explorer and observes the emblems of strength and virility that accompany him. This visual representation of passive agreement with the colonial project is countered by, Sel by Selika's strategic diplomacy, which seeks to manage colonization seemingly on her own terms. Through willful self-elimination in Act 5, she withdraws from colonial hands and dies by suicide next to an indigenous tree. Imitating to a certain extent Carthaginian Dido, likewise abandoned by a visiting hero, her departure makes impossible the intersection between political and personal conquest at the hands of a foreign invader. This appears to be indeed in line with the policies political, with the island's policy, this appears to be in line with the island's political policy concerning foreignness as a state of intolerable being. The rule stating that any foreigner who arrives upon her shores shall be immediately executed. 
the law of Salika's land is thus marked by an intolerance that refuses colonization. This refusal may be seen to triumph, no less, against Vasco's famous Act Four, Scene Two, Aria, which praises the island paradise. It is a song in search of acquisition that claims that which is objectively seen as personally and soon to be nationally possessed. Well, in Act One, Vasco had touted his purchase of two foreign goods, i.e. the slaves, the Liga and Nelusco. The inverted sense of the foreign and the local that emerges at the end of the opera frustrates any attempt to understand these as firm or fixed categories of identity. Though the label foreigner stands on shaky ground in an opera that oscillates the power structures that frame European and African Indian figures, the principled opposition to foreignness among both populations remains constant throughout the work. As Jean Andrews accurately notes, the institutions of power and religious intolerance present in Salika's island do not appear unlike the council of the Portuguese Inquisition. Quote, each leader is a chief priest of an oppressive authoritarian belief system whose most salient characteristics appear to be the requirement for absolute unquestioning obedience and the liberal application of cruelty and injustice. The orientalizing tendency to exoticize the East so as to minimize its threat to Western civilization reflects in a similarly orientalizing tendency conveyed in the association between Spanish political and theocratic doctrine and the black legend or La Lienda Negra. The historical depiction of Spain's diabolical afflictions impressed throughout their, their global colonies at whatever violent cost was deemed inappropriately necessary. If Salika dissolves the chains of foreignness through her diplomatic activities and autonomous decision to self-eliminate, Nelusco, her loyal servant, does through to the power of narration. In Act 3, Nelusco steps into the role of the pilot poet, where we see the term unknown surface again in his description as en pilote, en pilote inconnu. While steering the Portuguese ships around the Cape of Good Hope, Nelusco recounts to the onboard soldiers the story of Camoysia's Adamaster, the giant who signifies the perils of maritime travel between Atlantic and Indian shores. David Quint has accurately remarked that the successful overcoming of Adamaster by Vasco and his crew indicate the conclusion of Portugal as a European nation and the beginning of its start as a transoceanic empire. Feared as le géant des noix tempêtes, the giant of black storms, Adamaster inhabit inhabits the surroundings decidedly familiar to Nelusco and the other natives. Nous sommes pas en connu. Just as navigational authority had resided in the mouth of Salika, when in Act Two she corrects Vasco's map sketched onto the walls of their prison cell to inform him of the existence of Madagascar. So too does authorship rest beyond the mouth of the European during Nelusco's storytelling. What was Vasco's self-reporting narrative in Camoysia's text is colonized in the opera by the voice of the colonized people. If Quint's guiding question in his work on Camoysia and other classical and Renaissance epic poets was, quote, how do suppressed populations find a voice, if only one that curses, in the epic fictions of their conquerors, end quote, we might search for an answer in Vasco's pilot poet. Turning the Inquisitor's logic onto his own head in Act I, Nelusco refuses to provide information about the native land from which he and Salika hail, arguing that since the Europeans consider their purchased humans as nothing more than beasts of burden, why ever would they ask for information about their origins if they wouldn't do the same in the presence of an ox? Upon hearing this, Don Pedro exhales, what indomitable pride signaling the tension in failing to silence the voices of resistance, however physically restrained their bodies might be. It appears striking that the association between Nelusco and the inability to dominate reflects in the etymology of Adamaster the giant, he who cannot be tamed. Gabriela Cruz has convincingly argued for the character cross-pollination between Nelusco's figure and that of Camoysia's Adamaster, quote, the classical figure of otherness in Portuguese culture. Operatic song and character blend in what Cruz states is, quote, the segmented and static quality of this primitive voice, whose percussive rhythms enhance the disjointed quality of his speech, end quote. Further general assumptions of irrationality and, unintelligib and unintelligibility surface in Nelusco's casting as, quote, a primitive creature marked by a pendular alternation between fury and love, the cry and the murmur, end quote. 
pioneer of the blending between fiction and reality, Nelusco's authority in narration and his command at the head of the ship further work to minimize perceptions of cemented political hierarchies at play not only in the opera, but in the history of presumptions about differences in biological race. Such power audible in the art of narration is present indeed at the work's very outset. The emphasis with which Vasco presents his purchased human commodities as new and unknown, labels that would be understood as indicative of, quote, fragrant heresy by members of the singular origin theory believing Portuguese inquisition, is enhanced by the explorer's promise that nothing like what he presents may be found anywhere else in the world. Touting his unique discoveries as part of his campaign to round once again the Cape of Good Hope, Vasco prizes his possessions as products unfound in New World Spain, nor under the Asian sky. A tactic essential to Vasco's fundraising efforts in this instance is to display human difference as an object to be acquired, one which, however, will be assimilated and ultimately eradicated. The power or presumption Vasco wields in naming his subjects as unknown erases from them the history and heritage that is theirs. Thus, when questioned from what country she hails by the Portuguese council, Celica replies that a slave is granted no such answer, for slaves do not have countries. The power to possess and dispossess in Vasco's marketing of his conquered subjects is confirmed in Celica's response, despite her refusal to enlist herself as a subject to the Portuguese nation. And yet the permeability of characters to unchain themselves from the attendant presumptions that give meaning to the titles foreigner and other mirrors the oscillating praise of and contempt for the imperialist agenda originally found in Camoix's epic. In the same moment that Vasco's men depart the Lisbon docks to sail south and east towards the Indian horizon at the end of Canto IV, the voice of an old man of Bellum is heard lamenting, quote, the pride of power, the hollow conceits of fame and glory that destroy all peace. This counterintuitive voice in the epic, which questions and delays its very means and ends, resonates in the, in the attention the opera lends to the experiences of those enslaved. At the time of the opera's premiere in 1865, the institution of slavery around the globe had experienced tectonic criticism and changes, coinciding with the nearly contemporaneous fight against slavery during the American Civil War. Slavery in the French Caribbean had just been abolished a few decades prior in 1848, and before that, between 1833 and 1838, slavery had ended in the majority of the English colonies. Tommaso Sabatini has attended carefully to these factors in his study of the American and Caribbean world contexts that give shape to the opera. These and similar questions, including Portugal's status as the first European country to complete a transatlantic slave voyage to Brazil at the end of the, in the early 16th century, provided the frame for the opera to rehearse discussions about the status of slaves directly on stage. While detained in Lisbon at the beginning of Act Two, Celica and Nelusco debate the shared experiences of imprisonment to which both them and Vasco are subject. Seeking to deter him from murdering da Gama in his sleep, Celica reminds Nelusco of his humanity, urging, c'est un prisonnier comme nous, he's a prisoner like us. Cellmates though they may be, Nelusco accounts for little else that is shared in common between a Christian Portuguese man and a purchased human body. Just as the ideology of the European appears fractured between Vasco and his inquisitor opponents in Act I, a division enhanced by Comoisha's Canto VII critique of a Europe split between Catholics and Protestants, so too are the wounds of slavery not easily forgotten by all those who endure it. Still, it is of note that the mouthpiece in search of common humanity is that of an African Indian woman and not a European philosopher explorer. Locating commonality in the state of subjected suffering requires the effort to look past the categories of nation, race, sex, and even liberty, an effort Salika had modeled when saving Vasco by disingenuously claiming him to be a brother and friend of her native people. Salika's gesture towards the formation of community through empathetic understanding, diplomatic intervention, and the granting of freedom, especially after she reclaims her political rights again on the island, transgress the limits otherwise imposed by bodies of institutional power. It is this vision of shared experiences and similar histories that leaves a lasting impact onto listeners' ears, however unlikely and fantastical it might be. Thank you very much for your attention e vi ringrazio tutti per l'ascolto.
Many thanks to Kate Driscoll for this very interesting paper. Re-examination of an extremely um, important example, how to write historiography by musical drama, by grand opera. The opera itself, a critical examination of a self-evident, outdated, Eurocentric claim to rule. Thanks so much once more. We all are cordially invited to ask questions, some suggestions. Is there anyone who will, will intervene? No. Oh, yes. Susanna Pasticci. Hi. Uh, I would like to ask you something about uh, your critical and uh, theoretical reflection aimed at questioning opera's obligation to empire. Uh, in particular, you have talked about uh, hybrid personalities of the characters. Have you found an example of hybrid elements in the musical score too? Thank you. Oh, thank you for that question. Um, I can't say that I have yet because my my focus has primarily come in from a literary and historiographical um, position. But that's something that I that I want to do in kind of the second half of this part of this chapter of the project. So the first part, as you heard, was laying out these theoretical interests between history, reception, historiography, um, the context that surrounded 16th century Portugal, which were then received in 19th century France and Portugal. Um, and so the, the second half, which I haven't gotten to, um, is precisely studying that musical score to look at those hybrid personalities, especially if there are shared motifs or shared um, specific musical idioms that, that transcend the very boundaries that I'm interested in in uh, whose whose permeation I'm interested in. Um, so I appreciate the question and I look forward to being able to give you a, a response here soon. Please come to the board. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I, um, I, I, I much enjoyed that, that, that paper. I think I learned, I learned a lot. Um, I've got three questions that are actually all interrelated. Um, so it may actually just be, be one question. And the first one is really about agency. Um, you talk about um, uh, exclusively about Meyerbeer here, but I, it seems to me that a lot of what you're talking about um, really emanates from the librettist Eugène Scribe rather than Meyerbeer himself. And, um, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering what, what a reorientation towards, towards Scribe and away from Meyerbeer might actually bring to, uh, bring to your analysis. And uh, so, for example, I was wondering about, you, get, you gave us a rather lengthy quotation of the description of Selika. Um, and I'm trying to remember off the top of my head whether this is actually from the, um, from the, description in the libretto, in which case I think it's, it's Scribe's words, or is it somewhere else from my bit? That's a straightforward, it's got a bibliographical question. And then the final bit of, the, of, my, of, of, this, of this question is really about, um, and you alluded to this, I think, when you said that, that Scribe and Meyerbeer have been working on this project for 30 years when it was actually premiered in 1865. And I was just wondering whether, particularly in the light of your comments about um, the, the the, sh the, the changing positions vis-a-vis -vis colonial power, <laughs> powers and slavery between, let's say, 1830 and, um, um, and 1865 when the work is premiered. I, mean, I was wondering, wondering whether you had any views about the, the developing libretto and indeed music, because Maybe mm -hmm. had the score complete in draft in 1843, um, whether um, whether there are different um, different contexts to um, each of these phases in the work's gestation, and, and I'm, I, I recognise that, that you said very early on that you were not interested in um, uh, in the the, the, re the reception by French audiences, but I, I, I think this this plays into 
um, uh, into some of your comments about the relationship between the libretto and slavery. So, sorry, one question, three parts. <laughs> No, that's a, those are wonderful questions, and of course, I'm I'm grateful for the many uh, invitations to continue thinking a lot, especially as you're mentioning this evolutionary process of the opera. And I do agree that um, that I there would be a lot of room to spend more time reflecting on Scribe in particular, and his contributions to li to Liberato over time. So, um, on the note of that agency, I. I would look forward to to reorienting, as you say, um, maybe a little bit more away from Maya Bea, given that I'm not doing as much right now with the music, but that process would come next. Um, and thinking more about the the different elements that were taken into consideration in making that libretto, as you rightfully say, between 1830 and 1865, when all of these um, changes in policies about slavery throughout the world were changing. Um, so I would want to spend, I think, more time than in that case with different works by Sklieb, um that have to do specifically with this opera, but then also about um, other things that he was working on in those final years of his life. On the note of that quote, um, from what I remember doing when I was doing that part of the research, it's a letter to Scree, but I could be wrong, um, but I do believe it's a letter, it's a letter to Scree by Maybe because there is the mention towards the end of that quote um, that her personality as a hot figure uh, impacted by those geographical elements of her native origin will impact the, the musical colors. Um, so I'd have to go back and make sure, but but I do believe that that it's a letter that Maya Bear wrote to Scribe. That's fantastic, thank you. Because of course that that means that Maya Bear is is complicit in this um, in this process along along alongside Scribe, which kind of um, it's kind of what you'd expect given what we know about Maya Bear's engagement with with the process of of um, of, uh, of writing libretto, uh, writing libretti, but it actually also complicates the whole uh, the whole position quite uh, quite remarkably, doesn't it? It's uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 that's really very interesting. Thanks. I was just I was just um, was just I was just reflecting a little bit on on um, and you may resist this, and that would be perfectly perfectly reasonable, but on the the, the kind of nature of French, the difference between French colonialism from the time when Scribe was beginning to draft the libretto in the late 1830s, because the earliest phases of this libretto are that early, um, you know, when France is still engaged with North Africa and so on. And then up to um, the early 1860s, where its attentions are shifting to, you know, Mexico and, um, and a much further further flung parts of the, of the world, but including the kind of um, the kind of other domains that actually are, are, are constituted in L'Africaine itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering whether there's any mileage to be sort of derived from that, even though I know you, you say you're not interested in, um, in French audiences' reception of the, uh, of the, of the, of the, of the piece. No, and and I I probably want to correct a little bit what what I meant by that. Um, I do think that that there's a great history there, and I learned obviously very much from um, from many different uh, scholars on this, especially Gabriela Cruz's dissertation and work on on that particular reception. Um, I do think that there's a story to be unfolded between the French, as you're saying, their expanded geographical interests that go beyond Africa um, into parts of Mexico, but then also into Southeast Asia, and the reality of Portugal having lost a lot of their territory in South America and, and their, their minimizing efforts um, in Africa, in the southern part of Africa, to connect the western shores and the eastern shores. Um, and so on the one hand, we have the expansion of that French empire, and so one of the questions I'd asked was, um, how can we think about this as a kind of a, this receptive historiography as a form of colonial venture on its own in a moment where Portugal is losing territory and France is gaining territory? Um, yeah. So these are these are questions I'm interested in, but in the context of a 30 minute lecture, yeah, yeah. you can only. Yeah. No, that's so really much. interesting and and, and 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 to my mind quite fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Fascinating Peter, thank you so much. My question is probably a little out of the field, but I'm curious about how the singers at the premiere might have interacted with ideas you have presented here. 
Specifically, I'm curious about how the first interpreter of the Leica, Marie Sass, uh, might have emphasized some of uh, the characteristics you have articulated. This follows uh, on uh, Mark's question of agency. It is, what might the agency of singers bring to your analysis? That's a question. And it's a fascinating question um, to which I just say that I'm excited to learn a lot more about that. Um, so thank you, Hillary, for that question. I can't say that I have a perfect answer for you yet or a working answer. I need to think and study more of this figure. Um, so I, I thank you for your question. I definitely think that um, it, it does very well to consider how singers participate alongside composers and librettists and also poets in this transformative process. Um, and so I, I, I thank you for your invitation to, to go back and reconsider this. And also the different ideations of Silica, especially after 1865, the Silicas in Lisbon themselves, when at the, tor the towards the end of the 19th century, the opera became the emblem of the, of the successful empire after the, um, the overcoming of a skirmish that had come out in Mozambique. And so the opera was reimagined at the very end of the 19th century in Lisbon as this great, um, this great victory, this great uh, emblem of the, of the empire's success. And so in that case, it would be especially interesting to look all the more to the figure of Silica and, um, and that, that question of liberation and triumph against hands that want to colonize or even refuse colonize. So, so there's so many Silicas that I think are interesting to look at and we should start, I agree, with that 1865 figure. So thank you. <laughs> what time have you in Colorado actually? Oh, in Colorado, it's it's 8 a.m. right now. <laughs> Other questions? Other suggestions? No, I think we can end with many thanks once more to Kate Riskhol for this paper and good luck for your research. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone in the audience. Well, I can't see, but thank you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> certo. Maybe someone uh, has just announced that we have uh, a change in the program now uh, because of a strike uh, at his uh, university, Durham University. Eric G. Johnson Williams is not with us this afternoon. Um, so we can continue with Henry Stoltz's lecture. With this lecture, we remain in the realm of opera, but certainly not in a place that was written in opera history. Or maybe we are. Henry Stoll from Harvard University knows an opera that saw the light of day in Rion de Haiti at 1818, L'Entrée du Roi en son capital, a French opera on melodies from the French Revolution, but with an opening scene in the native language in Haitian Creole. And uh, we are now hearing more about it. Henry Stoll, Qui bon voit? Stage in Serenity at the Kingdom of Haiti, please. <laughs> please. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, so um, this paper is sort of me riffing on my dissertation work. My dissertation's entitled uh, The Unsung Revolution, the Music of Haitian Independence, 1804 to 1820. It is a music history of the first uh, 16 years of Haitian sovereignty. Uh, the reason why I chose the 16 years will become uh, evident in the course of this paper. Um, so I'll begin with this mural. Um, I took this photo while on a trip in Haiti. Um, in the year 1806, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, leader of the Haitian Revolution, was assassinated, leaving Haiti a nation divided. To the south, Alexandre Pétion, a Paris-educated homme de couleur, led a republic, while to the north, Henri Christophe, a man born into slavery, would rule as a monarch. 
As king of the Royal Daiichi, Christophe established an elaborate court, constructing the Citadel La Ferrière and the Sans Souci Palace, establishing ties with the British, and appointing princes, dukes, knights, and counts. According to those who knew him, the King of Haiti, Henri Christophe, also had a love for ceremony and musical extravagance. He, he, quote, frequently entertained himself with music, of which he was passionately fond, wrote an English surgeon employed by Christophe. And the most popular martial airs played by the whole band in the court of the palace appear to afford him the highest gratification, end quote. Another English visitor writes, as commander in chief at Cap Francois, um, present day Cap Haitien, he often gave public dinners and his entertainments were handsome, not to say magnificent. Another foreign critic goes still further in his acclaim of the musical luxuries of Christophe's court. Let not the reader laugh at the idea of a court ball at Haiti. Let him rather figure to himself the most brilliant ball pareil he has ever seen in the most elegant salon Paris affords, and he will then have but a faint idea of the magnificence of Sans Souci. Let him people it with all the elegance and fashion, affection and dandyism that he has ever met with in more civilized countries. Let him add titles and uniforms, ribbons and stars, ices and refreshments, and all the etc. incidental to wealth and power. Let him then call in a magician and turn all the company black, and he will be able to picture to himself the last court ball I saw at Haiti. Now music, like painting, like architecture, like poetry, uh, would serve as a means for Henri Christophe to assert his claims to monarchical authority. Like the kings of old, Henri Christophe had his composers and dance masters, his ballrooms and salons, his theaters with playwrights, directors, set designers, and machinists, his ballets and operas, his songbooks and libretti, and a Royal Academy of Music with professors of violin, clarinet, flute, horn, and bassoon, some hired from abroad, others drawn from the ample supply of native talent. Now, as part of my research, I've been assembling the music of early Haiti, and from this 14-year period, I've identified two operas, one cantata, and some 60 or 70 songs written during Christophe's rule. Um, though Haiti did not possess music printing technology, uh, and no examples of original compositions survive from this period, reconstructing these song parodies, or contrafacta, has allowed me to offer some sense of how the music of Christophe's court may have sounded. So a little bit about opera at the Kingdom of Haiti. It was Christophe's wish, writes one Englishman, that the inhabitants of the kingdom be entertained with theatrical performances. In the capital, Christophe had two opera houses built, the first across from the church at his palatial complex of Sans Souci, um, though this edifice would prove to be insufficient. So if you see um, on the left of this image, this is a painting, I believe from 1816, painted by one of his court painters who was trained by, I believe, Richard Evans, a Scottish portrait artist. Anyway, if you look to the left, you see the church. I believe the edifice right across from the door would have been the theater. Um, but Christophe would be dissatisfied with the theater's proximity. Uh, he could not drive there in his carriage. And so he had a second built at La Fossette, a public promenade placed at the city's outskirts. A uh, French council to Haiti describes the edif edifice thus, um, the theater was not large, but rather well decorated and always well lit with spermaceti candles. Yet it was pointless to enlarge it as admission was free um, and by invitation only. It was, in a word, the court spectacle. The orchestra, the decorations, the costumes, the troops, all were at the king's feet. 
Charles Mackenzie, then British Consul General to Haiti, alighted upon this same structure, describing it as a small theater, which Christophe caused to be erected in some incredibly short time by some German artificers to prove how promptly his wishes could be realized. Another English visitor furnishes this following picture of the theater. It is an oblong edifice composed chiefly of wood, entirely destitute of ornament, and stands on a rising ground to the right of the main road, having in front the harbor and behind it the hills which overlook the Cape. Now, facing the harbor, the theater must have been beautifully placed, but it was not open during the writer's stay. This he rashly attributes to a lack of appreciation for the dramatic arts among the Haitians. He writes, for the people not being prepared to derive much amusement of, for the French drama, they felt no interest in witnessing the performance of any piece. At the same time, none but dukes, counts, and barons were qualified to be the dramatis personae, and these men deemed it beneath their dignity to descend to the capacity of players, unless at the instance of their master. Now, by 1821, a year after Christophe's death, this second theater was already in ruins, no doubt on account of its having been so far removed from the city center. Um, it was rumored to have been constructed um, by a group of German builders, as you heard, uh, two, in two months, estimates one Haitian critic. Now, at the Haitian court, operas were performed by the King's Theater Company, a court institution, quote, composed of amateurs who perform for the pleasures of their majesties and for the perfection of their art, end quote. Their repertoire was often French and often 18th century, uh, the favorite pieces of the Bourbon monarchy and of Haiti's former colonists. During the years 1814 to 1820, the personnel of the uh, King's Theatre Company was as follows. So these are the members of the Royal Academy of Music. This is um, sort of the di di direction of the opera company. You'll notice the machinist is named Ogun, which is actually the name of the West African god of war. Um, I wonder how you might have gotten that name. Frédéric Touka, in addition to being, um, being designing the decorations, was also uh, another court painter. He taught at the Academy of Art as well. So here are the actors and the actresses and ballet dancers. Now, on occasion, these royal players would accompany Christophe in his peregrinations throughout his kingdom, transported along with their costumes and decorations. All were susceptible to being called to perform, writes a French consul to Haiti. Barons, counts, dukes, and knights of Christophe's court were called upon to perform the roles that they played in their daily life. To give an example, in January of 1814, the royal family departed their palace to celebrate Epiphany at one of their many palaces um, called Bellevue Le Roi. Um, in a rare and intimate piece of correspondence, this is from the British Library, we see Christophe writing to his son, Prince Victor, to request that his royal intendant come to perform a role in an upcoming performance of André Gretry's Richard Coeur de Lyon, or Richard the Lionhearted, a perennial favorite from 1784, performed no less than a few dozen times in Haiti's colonial period. Christophe's family was also musically accomplished. His son, Victor, and his two daughters, Amethyste and Athenaire, were all taught to sing. Like many Haitian women of high birth, his daughters could also paint, dance, and play the piano, harp, and guitar. His daughter, Athenaire, was reported to also have appeared in the theater, though her father allowed this only grudgingly for fear of corrupting her morals. An English visitor to the Kingdom of Haiti even recalls being treated to a harp performance by the queen and princesses, and later to an opera at the Royal Theater. Years later, while on vacation in Italy, uh, James Fenimore Cooper, the American author, attended an opera at Florence's Teatro della Pergola, where he spotted the former Queen of Haiti, along with, quote, a daughter or two. 
And I'm going to go off script for a moment just to describe, um, to relate sort of the, uh, the life of the Queen of Haiti. Um, Christophe has an, epilept uh, sorry, an apoplectic fit in uh, 1819 um, that renders him basically paralyzed. Uh, his power is threatened. He suspects uh, a, he will be overthrown. Um, in 1820, in October, he commits suicide. Uh, his, the, the men in the family are killed along with a lot of the, uh, his secretaries and the, the men who worked for him and his daughter, his two daughters and his wife go into exile first in London and then they wind up in Italy. Um, behind the train station in Pisa, you can find this um, Capuchin monastery where the Queen of Haiti is today buried along with one of her daughters. One died of tuberculosis, the other died of a fall. Um, the queen outlived her daughter by, uh, outlived her daughters by about 30 years and um, spent most of her life just kind of retired in, in, in Pisa, living a quiet existence, and later joined a convent. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the inside of the church, and here are both of their tombs. This is um, from a trip I made couple years ago. So visitors to the court of Christoph at, observed, at times ironically, the diplomatic role played by music, typical as an account published in 1844 by British General Edward Burke. He writes, for example, that following a harp performance, Christoph offered, offered to have an opera conjured up for him and his entourage and did so the following evening. Some years later, when Burke revisited the court, uh, after an exchange of salutations, Christoph inquired eagerly of him, will you dine with me? Will you go to my opera? Will you visit Fort Ferrière? When Burke finally exited the capital, he did so with books and newspapers that Christoph had lent him, extracts from which, he snidely remarked, would be in no small degree amusing. Now, publications from the Haitian kingdom were, in fact, reviewed by the contemporary European and American press. These columns offered re uh, readers rare accounts of Haiti at a time when the stream of travel literature had somewhat dried out. What this means is that the songs and operas that I'm discussing today were, in some sense, symbols of political power, fashion for foreign export, and boasting of the pleasures of the Haitian court. Many Haitian critics anxious to prove their nation civilized, pointed to the nation's mastery of French music and fine arts as an instantiation or perhaps logical conclusion of their enlightened status. In this passage by the Baron de Vatay, one of the Kingdom of Haiti's most forceful secretaries and defenders, um, holds up the fine arts as evidence of, their, of Haiti's strides towards civilization. He writes, we have also made essays on the fine arts and are convinced that proper masters are alone wanting to enable us shortly to pr produce our Le Poussins, our Mignards, our Rameaux, and our Gretries. In a word, experience has demonstrated to the world by the astonishing progress we have made in learning and in civilization that the capacity of blacks and whites for, acquiring, uh, for the acquiring of the arts and sciences is equal. Read the history of man. Never was a similar prodigy seen in the world. Let the enemies of the black show a single instance of a people situated as we found ourselves who have achieved greater things and this in less than a quarter of a century. L'entrée du sa capitale, the entrance of the king in his capital, comes to us from the year 1818, year 15 of Haitian independence and two years before the death of its namesake. As such, it arrives late within the king's tenure and amid growing resentment of the monarchy. Only two years later would, would Christophe end his life. The opera's author is Jus Chanlat, the honorable Comte de Rosier, as he was then stylized, an early Haitian man of letters who authored poems, treatises, songs, plays, and operas for the kingdom of Haiti. Uh, this is his coat of arms. Uh, they had a Scottish artist come to the kingdom to design a coat of arms in, I believe, 1812. The sole surviving copy 
of Chanlot's first opera, a slim 60-page livret, is today uniquely housed at Harvard's Houghton Library. Identified as an opéra vaudeville, it features dialogue interspersed with contrafacta, all remarking on the virtues of the royal family and their empire of emancipation and excess. Cast in seven scenes, the opera takes the form of a stage pageant. Ajit's kaleidoscopic change of scene reveals another stratum of society assembled to view the king's coming cortege. In all, we are introduced to 22 characters, with one, Dami, the poet, played by the playwright himself. Now, not surprisingly, there is very little mystery in the opera's unfolding action. The king will indeed enter his capital, and this to the scripted joy and revelry of the company. A spirited chorus of Vincenzo Puccita's Vive, uh, Vive Enrico will then close the work, retexted in celebration of, quote, Henry the Avenger, Henry the Vanquisher, the favorite of victory herself. So scene one of the opera opens on the Place de la Fossette, a site then overlooking the ruins of the colonial capital. At the center of the stage stands a column dedicated to independence. Marguerite, broom in hand, and her beloved Valentin are the first to take the stage. In exchanges marked by flirtation and flattery, they catalog the virtues of Papa Henri, they call him. Valentin goes so far as to enumerate the pleasures of the court. Concerts, spectacles, festivals, balls, fireworks, illuminations. Now, Sean Lott here calls upon a scene well known to Enlightenment opera, that of the patois speaking peasant lovers. However, our lovers speak very significantly Haitian Creole, a fusion of West African languages and 18th century French. And I feel it worth mentioning, the closest relative to what we now know as uh, Cajun French in the US. Uh, to be clear, the campaign for Haitian sovereignty was in part predicated on the championing of Haiti's linguistic heritage. Uh, for reasons ethnographic, parodic, or political, Haitian Creole by this time had been translated in a few orthographies, first by colonists, um, then by Haitians. However, I'd like to take a moment to appreciate Chanlat's Creole for its commitment to verisimilitude and for its latter-day legibility. Marguerite and Valentin's chirpy banter is in fact a curiosity in the standardization of the Haitian Creole language, one of the earliest Creole texts written by a Haitian. In this snapshot of Creole circa 1818, uh, we can appreciate a few grammatic, grammatical forms and, 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 and pronouns that are no longer in existence. Um, so that we can better appreciate this feat of translation, I've translated one passage of the opera into English and also into contemporary Haitian Creole. In contemporary Haitian Creole, it would read, Dis-moi donc, Valentin, yo di nous bon papa nous va arriver. C'est parti quand on a canton ça. Now we bon maman nous, bon roi nous, belle petite prince royal nous, à toute belle princesse royal nous yo. Nous t'avons déjà passé. It's immediately legible for a Haitian Creole speaker. And this is in a language that people said wasn't standardized, quote unquote, until the 20th century. Uh, later on, towards the end of this scene, Vadantan reveals himself to be something of a songsmith, producing from his pocket to Marguerite's joy a song she had requested. He informs her of, it, of its being set to Vive en les quatre, an air familiar to her to which she responds disappointed, but it's not in Creole. Mais li pas en Creole. This, Valentin assures her, is so that all the world may know it. When Marguerite wants to, he insists, she speaks better French than Madame Syntax herself. Paper in hand, Marguerite proceeds to deliver the song A Prima Vista, receiving a kiss for her efforts. Uh, this recording was um, made in the bathroom of the American Academy in Rome, so pardon the echo. Is it, is it not playing? Yes, can I?
Sì, è attivato l'audio. Qua, qua, qua è attivato. to have roommates who are um, classically trained singers. So a cherished conceit of the monarch that Henry I of Haiti resembles Henry IV of France is here exploited as it was throughout the kingdom. Immensely popular in colonial days, Charles Collet's opera La Partie de Chasse de Henri IV Henry IV's hunting party would remain a favor of the King of Haiti, so much so that in 1820, Chanlat would write a second opera entitled La Partie de Chasse du Roi, the King's Hunting Party, a loose parody of uh, Collet's opera with an original score by a Haitian composer. <coughs> Enough of that. Okay, in the opera's third scene, Dami, the character performed by Juste Chanlat himself, uh, pulls a song from his portfolio and presents it to another character, Lotes, the hostess, adding, may it be to your liking. She thanks him and she proceeds to sing. A loving tribute to Queen Marie Louise of Haiti, the song praises the queen's comely virtues and noble attributes, asking, to celebrate this cherished one, is it not to celebrate Henri? For those who read French, I put the text up there. Uh, I'm going to play the song's first verse, as recorded by Haitian-American soprano Melissa Joseph, and I'll leave the source of the music a surprise. Um, incidentally, this is a statue outside of his um, palace, one, one, only one of the 12 uh, which were there originally, and you'll notice by the mask uh, sort of below her exposed breast there, this was the goddess of the theater.
Okay. So yes, the melody is derived from um, Die Zauberflöte and is originally scored for bass. Um, but Chanoa refers to the borrowed tune as Dans ses Sejour Tranquille, um, which is from Les Mystères d'ici, a French adaptation of Die Zauberflöte by a Bohemian composer, um, Le Deux de Buenville of Wenzel Lachnik. It is in this adapted form that Mozart's final opera was introduced to France and in which it was familiar to Sean Watts. Uh, Mozart's music, to be clear, was a rarity in early Haiti. Uh, it was eclipsed by that of French composers like Gaitri and Dalirac. But that Sean Watts recasts this tune as a song for soprano is a curious decision and rather serves to illustrate the ability of parody to not only affect text, but also performance practice. Um, in the fifth scene of L'Entrée du Roi, Chanlot enlists another trope familiar to Enlightenment opera, that of the visiting foreigner. An Englishman, L'Anglais, takes the stage, where his macaronic French provides many a comedic ploy. Delivered as an aside, he too voices praise for the king, remarking on his intelligence, grace, and generosity. Of all the monarchs in the world, he proclaims, Hades is one of the greatest and most glorious. He would very much like never to return to London. So happy is he in the northern capital. Chanois here draws on, his, on a knowledge of English he attained in the United States, spelling out the Englishman's stutters and solecisms to comedic effect. I bribed another roommate with donuts to record this. Je suis bien content de n'être point parti pour London. Je n'aurai pas eu cette grande satisfaction. Le peuple de cette country, il être aisible, généreux, mais rien de plus gracieux. Je suis bien. The 1810s were a period of great Anglophilia for the Kingdom of Haiti, and this relationship is amply borne out in the Englishman's monologue. Uh, Christophe maintained an active communication with abolitionists in England and was so taken with a speech given by a visiting Englishman at his coronation that Chanlot writes this uncannily similar scene into the opera. The, the speech is very similar. Chanois might also be interpreted as recruiting a technique from French imperial spectacle, staging Haitian diplomacy and legitimizing the monarchy through favorable, com favorable comparisons with all the world's monarchs. At a time of growing political isolation, Christophe's concern and that of future leaders would be a lack of international recognition and an inhibited embargo. So if we hold that this opera is a patriotic work fashioned for foreign consumption, we can interpret Chanwa as dealing in an enlightenment economy of folk expression and oral culture as representative of the tenets of universal kinship and humankind's natural good. In the opening scene, Margaret and Valentin reference, for instance, the banza, a Haitian predecessor to the banjo, the bambula, a drum, the kalinda, an Afro-Caribbean dance, the Bambucha, another Afro-Caribbean dance, and the Samba nation of West Africa. Yet I think Franz Fanon makes an apt observation um, of such productions, warning that they may also risk echoing the exoticism of colonial productions. Um, and I quote at length, given the relevance of his observations, quote, at the very moment when the native intellectual is anxiously trying to create a cultural work, he fails to realize that he is utilizing techniques and language which are borrowed from the stranger in his country. He contents himself with stamping these instruments with a hallmark which he wishes to be national, but which is strangely reminiscent of exoticism. The native intellectual who comes back to his people by way of cultural achievements behaves in fact like a foreigner. Sometimes he has no hesitation in using a dialect in order to show his will to be as near as possible to the people but the idea that he expresses and the preoccupations he has taken up with have no common yardstick stick to measure the real situation which the men and the women in his country know. Um, I think his commentary well pertains to our co conference's theme. After all, the, pro the process of aesthetic decolonization is not without its ambivalences, but I'd like to end on a more charitable note. 
Through reconstructing this opera, I wish to show how Kristoff made claims to political legitimacy through associations with European imperial spectacle, enlightenment thought, and the French hereditary monarchy. But this opera is about more than colonial mimicry. To study the kingdom of Haiti is to study the shadow cast by the enlightenment. To understand that the great axioms of the age that man is born free and everywhere he is in chains were most often understood metaphorically. When the Marseillaise, for instance, denounces vile chains and old slavery, it gestures towards some of the most stunning inconsistencies and contradictions in France's revolutionary vision. One that was ultimately complacent with its colonial holdings and the unprecedentedly low price of sugar. It has been said that we can locate the culmination of the 18th century with the end of the French Revolution. If that is so, and I don't believe that's beyond argument, then the Declaration of Haiti's Independence in 1804 should be held up as one of the foundational events of the long 19th century. Haiti's victory against France, you might even say, enlightened the Enlightenment. Now my question for today, however, is this. Could one make similar observations of the music of the Kingdom of Haiti? If the Haitian Revolution took Enlightenment thought to its furthest and most radical conclusions, might these musical parodies have improved in some way upon their originals? A refuting assumptions about originality, precedence, teleology, the master composer, this opera, like the Haitian Revolution, challenges us to take parodies or second takes seriously particularly as the long 19th century saw the various trappings of power, of which opera is no small part, get taken up by the Americas and refashioned in the critiques of European sovereignty and Enlightenment hypocrisy. Indeed, I hear in L'Entre-Douance Capitale, a case too important to the history of power and aesthetic decolonization to be overlooked, of a nation that sang a new sovereignty without changing its tune. Thank you. Thank you for this paper. Very interesting case of French operatic culture in North Haiti. Um, or example, curious example for the worldwide reception of opera comique, you know? Mm. Um, so we can open the discussion, please. First and second. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, <laughs> I'm the guest. And then <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you made reference to Franz Fanon's critique mm -hmm. uh, in the end. And I would like to know if uh, there is any uh, relation with uh, the movement of Creolite, Martinican movement of Creolite later in the, in the, in the next century, uh, if there's any uh, political uh, reference or uh, uh, try to trace back uh, to this uh, historical episode. You know, it's interesting you ask that. Scholars are just starting, starting to sort of dig up this tradition. Part of the reason, it's not because scholars in Haiti haven't been interested. There are writings in Haiti. But interestingly enough, a lot of these treatises, operas, writings from the Kingdom of Haiti, from the Republic of Haiti in the South as well, exist in maybe one or two copies in the world, usually in France, usually in the US, sometimes in Germany, um, and almost never in Haiti. And in those countries, there wasn't a lot of interest in them for quite a long time. I mean, the only copy of this opera is in Harvard, strangely enough. Um, now, connections are being made. I mean, it's, it's, people are starting to move the date of post-colonial criticism in general back to, you know, 1816, when you get these incredible writings by the Baron de Vataille at, at, the, at the Kingdom of Haiti, which are just astonishingly forceful and convincing criticisms of France. But I would say that connections, those connections haven't been made until recently because these materials haven't been available until recently. All this stuff is basically newly digitized. 
Jesus. Thank you. This was really, really interesting. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about the sort of global transactions that allowed this music to arrive in Haiti. Because my understanding is that there was a special relationship with the British. So I'm wondering whether, how, how this music circulated and how it got there in the first place. Yeah. Thanks. I don't know much about the scores that were, well, maybe a little bit. I mean, there was a huge opera culture in colonial Haiti. They said per capita, colonial Haiti had more opera houses than Paris. I mean, it was the richest colony in the world, I think, at least in the French Empire, if not in the world. They had Stradivarius violins. I mean, this was an extremely wealthy um, colony with lots of opera. And uh, we, I mean, there's even an image during the Haitian Revolution of, of the the Cape Haitian being um, sacked, and you see, you know, formerly enslaved people putting on costumes from the opera house and, you know, holding scores in their hands. And, you know, we might extrapolate from that image. Um, scores might have been left behind in the opera houses. Scores might have been all over the place, for all we know. Um, and we also know that, you know, Sean Lott, uh, and a lot of other men like him, they were educated in Paris. Um, and they, and I do know there was import of um, song books, um, very often, you know, cantiques and, 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 and um, sometimes piano, you know, pedag pedagogical type music. But we do know that there was some sort of import of, of uh, scores. The problem is no scores actually remain. And if they do, they certainly weren't printed in Haiti. So it's very difficult to say um, where things were coming from. But I don't know how much, I don't think it has much to do with the British in an interesting way. The British did send a lot of things to Haiti. I've read some letters where um, they send, you know, a lot of books for pedagogical, um, purposes, they send teachers, they don't send music, um, interestingly enough. Another question, please. Thank you, Henry. I, I, I enjoyed that enormously. Um, I, I've got a question about the two pieces that you were talking about, uh, L'Entrée du Roi en sa capitale um, and, uh, and La Partie du Chasse du, du Roi. You described the first one as an opéra vaudeville and you said all the pieces were contrafactor. Mm -hmm. um, and you, didn't sh you showed us, I think, the, the title page. I, yeah. I take it that in the libretto there is an, a cue for the, for the piece that the song is actually taken from. That's correct, yeah. So it says air de something, exactly. and then it gives you the new text that you sing, you sing that to. That's, that's, thank you. Is this, but the same isn't the case in La Partie du, du, uh, du Chasse du, 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 du Roi. That's a different type of discourse, is that right? That's right. Uh, the, that had an original score by a man, I believe this was Eugène Cassien. He, I mean, he's just referred to as Monsieur Cassien, but there is a Eugène Cassien who was a general in the Haitian army. There were very few people in those, you know, in that circle of society. So I believe it was probably the same person, but the score doesn't remain. Right, but it, but it also includes a, a, um, uh, an excerpt from Les Mystères d'ici. Uh, L'entrée du Ante Capital does, yes. Ah, excuse me, right. Yes. Excellent. That makes, that makes far more sense. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so, so in other words, L'entrée du Roi dans sa capitale is actually a comedy vaudeville. Yes. That's what I would That's, call it. It's yes. not an opera vaudeville at all. And then, and this is a, and then this is a, um, uh, and this is a full blown, a full blown opera. It'd be interesting to find out who actually put that, A, wrote, really wrote the music to, um, La Partie du Chasse du, du Roi. Because obviously, he, the, the, he's a, he's a, He's a military man. He it doesn't figure in the list of the um, musicians for the uh, the Academy du Roi that you gave us. Uh, yeah, I guess he doesn't. I don't think he does figure into that. But a lot of the general, I mean, almost everybody who was high ranking was a general. Right. <laughs> Sean Lott was a general. Everybody was a general. So I don't know if he was. Um, I know that Cassian does write other music. 
they, they do collaborate in 1821 as, to a, together on a hymn to independence, but which also doesn't remain um, and which falls kind of outside the scope of my dissertation. But Cassian does write a couple other examples of music. Right, that's very interesting. So, uh, so L'Entrée du Roi, how, how many of the, of the, of the original pieces of music have you been able to identify? Almost everything except for one. Right, and, the, and what sort of pieces are they, are they taken from? Are they, are they taken from opera comique that are actually otherwise part of the repertory or? Um, they're taking, very, most of the time it's from pretty, the Sorry. standard candidates, um, it's taken from, um, you know, the most famous operas of the 18th century. Sometimes they're French folk songs. Sometimes they are taken from uh, really quite obscure pieces. I mean, the Mystère d'Ici, that's really a quite a rare thing. Uh, I, I don't, I'm surprised that they, and which was not performed in the colonial period. So I'm not quite sure how they knew of it. Um, and that tells you something, doesn't it, about the circulation of, 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 of music? You could, I mean, the, the uh, Les Mystères d'Ici was certainly published with um, individual, individual numbers. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could quite easily hypothesize a, a single, you know, four-page copy of um, of the French translation of of, of in diesen Heiligen Halle, um, uh, coming coming to come to Haiti relatively straightforwardly. That would mm -hmm. that would that would explain explain that quite quite nicely. So right, so so it's it's mostly opera comique that are already known um, uh, in uh, in Haiti. That's extremely interesting. Yeah, and French revolutionary tunes, which were of course all the rage in the during the colonial era because the colonists were singing them. Right, right. And these are, these are tunes from the Clé de Caveau or... Um... Often Clé de Caveau, yeah. Right, right. So it's, 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 it's behaving exactly mm -hmm. like a Scribian Comme du Vaudeville from exactly the same period. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure. Thank you once more. And... Uh, applause. At the end uh, of our afternoon section, we will hear Salvatore Morra from the Universitat de la Tuscia to take. But, uh, Professor Morra's lecture is uh, dedicated uh, to a moment of transition from orally transmitted to notated music in French Tunisia around 1870 to Maluf, uh, stylistic redefinition of old Arabic Andalusian musical traditions and uh, as resistance against French colonial rule, please. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for waiting until this last paper of the last session. And thanks uh, to both the committees for organizing this, in, organizing this fascinating conference and um, in this, in this um, amazing location. Um, so let's start from... from a short video. <laughs> Rashidiya Music Institute, as you can see, it was founded in 1935, and this is a, a short um, ethnographic sketch that I took, a video that I took in, uh, in Tunisia in 2015 during my fieldworks. 
And it was uh, a special event because it was the 18th anniversary festival of the foundation of this uh, uh, institute, which um, promoted and conserved um, Tunisian music in the 30s of 20th century. So Malouf, and this is just to give an idea of what, of what this music is. So Malouf is, is the most complex uh, musical genre in Tunisia and uh, is a result of multiple fo musical forms as a nuba, qasida, shugul, instrumental bashraf, istik um, improvisation, istikbar, zendeli, muahashahat, and zajal. And stylistic influences that come from African, Egyptian, and Turkish Ottoman. So generally Malouf can be read as, as more or less synonymous with what Ruth Davies refers to as Tunisian art music, and uh, Getat especially referred to as a nuba, so a sweet, as well as genres that are, that are perceived to be less traditional, artful, or less sophisticated. For example, the ognia, so the song, the popular songs, uh, which were which have been variously performed in 20th century by the Jaouk d'Ensemble, the name for the ensemble is Jaouk, the Malouf, the Firka, the orchestra, the classic orchestra, and, and, uh, and uh, the new ensemble, the Jaouk Nouveau, and in different performance, in different contexts. So this paper is going to, uh, to focus on the process of redefinition from oral transmission into Western notation that Malouf underwent in 19th century. So I'm going to ask the following questions. What was Tunisian Malouf music at the time of the protectorate, which started in 1881? Where were the colonized and how did they resist oppressions? And how did it reflect the French Tunisian paradigm? So, a brief historical recognition of 19th century visual representation of the Malouf ensemble helps introducing my argument. So, since the 19th century, the Tunisian ensemble, as we said, the Jaouk ensemble, had typically used the oud, the Arab lute, the darbuka, the, the the percussion, sometimes also the, the, the nagarat, which are percussions played with the sticks, and the rebeb, the two-string fiddles, as also showing the drawing title Le Musicien Tunisien dans le Parc du Trocadero, which was signed by Bernard to illustrate the article Le Café Tunisien et son Orchestre, written by Philippe Cantemarche for the Paris, Paris exhibition in 1878. So you, you can see on the right the, the, the lute, the Tunisian lute, and then the, the rebab, the tar, and the darbuka in this description. So this illustrated the article, Le Café Tunisien, which had, of course, a sort of a oriental gaze and described the performance, the review of the performance in a negative way, especially the way of producing the song, the singing, and, um, and on the other hand, also uh, describing a melody as, uh, as coming from the desert. Uh, and th th this music was actually, um, uh, it is actually an urban uh, music, so it's, it's an urban ensemble, that, and it's, they are instruments that are not used in the desert or in the south of Tunisia, but they are instruments that you, you may find in, in, the, in the urban spaces, so in the capital of Tunis, in Susa, Monastir, uh, and so on. So North African musical instruments, especially, were, were then collected in 19th century at the Paris Exposition, 1867, 78, 1889, and in London, they were collected, uh, those were the expositions. They were collected in London, as I said, 1867. They were collected in Paris, 1873, 
in the Berlin, actually, in 1894, and they were co also collected by uh, Victor Mayon in Brussels. So there were instruments and collections that came in 1878, 1896. So the photo, these are the photo titled Young Man Seated playing a nude while a young woman stands nearby was possibly taken by the photographer Tancred Dumas, the French photographer, between 1860-1870 in Tunisia or Algeria, we don't know, and it, it is now held at the Congress Print of Photograph Division of Washington in the US. But this is the oldest known photograph of, of, of a Malouf player. So during this period in Europe, the Malouf largely exists as a, as a musical genre residing in the widespread collective imagination for the exotic East. So what Fouser defines as the sonic harder. But let's see what was happening in Tunisia at the same time. So the colonies' presence urged raising awareness about Tunisian music culture in general that was taken up by the several associations of music which reveal an active music life in Tunisia, in the capital, also in Tunis, and elsewhere. So, for example, we had the Sheikh Medina uh, Association, La Chorale, La Sahelienne, La Philharmonie Arabe, La Nasseria, as, uh, as uh, many other musical associations. So a first point uh, I wish to make is that it is clear that the music life in Tunisia, related particularly to Tunisian music, did not begin in the 20, in 1920s and 1930s with the, with the promotion of the Baron Radolf de Langer and his palace in uh, in Sidi Bou Said, 20 kilometers from, uh, from the capital. So it did not begin under his patronage, or even with the Rashidiya Institute that we saw um, uh, developing this, this promotion of Tunisian music in, uh, since 1935. So the cultural activity of those associations give an overview of the music activity during the colonial time that were Tunisian Malouf orientated. So, for example, the Sahelian, but also the La, La Philharmonie Arabe, for example, states that its repertory includes the, some hairs uh, of uh, indigenous Arab uh, songs in, in Arabic, uh, and where they, they used some, some musical instruments that were also Arabs. And they sang, as you say there, they sang, uh, as it stated in the, in the statute of the, of the Société Philharmonique Arabe, uh, they sang, uh, they probably played the, the La Marseillaise and they sang La Marche du Bay. So let's have, a, let's have a listen to what probably this Marche du Bay sounded like. So this is this that was recorded uh, as you can see in the 1903. Okay. sounded like the 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 the, the march du bay played and performed by the uh, philharmonie harab and this is um, um so that there was recorded there was the website of the sorry of the center of, of arab and mediterranean music so which is the national phonograph archive based in in uh, in, in, in sidi busaid in tunisia and uh, and they, they started to digitalize all the recordings they, they have since uh, uh, 20th century 
of, uh, of uh, Tunisian music um, and they started to digitalize it in 2011 thanks to Dr. Uh, Anas Grab, uh, who was the former director of the, of the center. This is another taken from, uh, from also, also from the, from the school, a school from the center, taken from the center, for the archive of the center, and of Antonin Lafage, who actually reorganized and rearranged, harmonizing these, uh, this old, old, the, the, the corpus of hymns, bacal hymns that were sung and played during uh, celebrations of, uh, of, uh, of the bay. But some other associations, like uh, the, the Sheikh Medina, they had 40 musicians to con conducted by Klaman Nataf, for example, which performed in Berlin in 1896, and they show a remarkable international activity. Also, La Chorale, which participated in several competitions abroad, in Algiers, in Paris in, in, in 1890. And the Sheikh Medina in 1996. So, during the French protectorate, the Tunisian capital city became the site of cosmopolitan multicultural experiments aimed at imprinting Arab, Tunisian, Maghrebian, and also European theatrical and musical traditions onto its diversified communities. So first there was a development beginning 1856 featuring acculturation of foreign elements, and this was followed by intercultural dialogue of staging plays and operas translated and adapted to Arabic taste. So the two main communities participating in the Tunis music scene at the end of the 19th century were Jewish Tunisian on one side, who were considered native, Jewish Italian from Livorno, who arrived in Tunisia in the 18th century, and people of Italian orange but of French nationality. So they built theatres such as the Palazzo Nieco, the Le Teatro Tapia, uh, Le Teatro Italiano in, uh, in Sidi Zamullen Street, and, uh, and some other theaters like the Paradiso, that then in 20th century they all became uh, um, uh, cinema uh, places. All of them were largely devoted anyway to Western classical music. Of course, on the one hand, here there is all these loaded Orientalism gates in the wake of Edward Said concerning the images of the Paris exhibitions. But my focus here is, is on something different of, 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 of the idea of Said and, and exoticism and Orientalism. I want to reconceptualize the history of evolution of Tunisian society during the 19th century, showing how Tunisia was absorbed between two imperial powers. The rising up of French protectorate on one side and the disgregation of the Turkish Ottoman Empire on the other side. And I want to start again from, from an image. So we are again in 19th century and the French painter uh, Georges Paul Joseph Darras probably painted this um, this, uh, this painting in, uh, during his, his travel in North Africa. And um, um, the, the, the painting is titled The Turkish Musicians, uh, of course with an unknown date. And um, in this case, the, the, the Tunisian hood in the middle is paired with two percussion instruments. And from the title, the Turkish musicians, we learn that Turkish players might have used this instrument, this Tunisian instrument, although we do not know where Daras painted it, in, whether in Algeria or in Tunisia. And it is likely Daras had been told, maybe, or imagined that they were Turkish from a black gland acorn on the, on the, on the side here. Um, and also from the kobita, the accessory attached to the red woolen hat. So the Arab Tunisian allusion Shashiya, the one, uh, the one on, the, on the, the hat, the actual Tunisian hat, red hat, which is part of the traditional belded urban citizen of the Medina, such as producers, artisans, shoppers, and, and, and is part of, the, of this traditional costume and maybe posing in one of the Ottoman Baikal palace of North Africa, especially in Tunisia, rather than from the instrument played. So probably those Turkish musicians probably were Tunisian, performing Tunisian instrument in, in a Turkish Ottoman Baikal palace. Mm -hmm. 
But what is interesting and, and very much related to, um, I just show you a video of, uh, of uh, the oldest uh, Tunisian old Tunisian instrument that arrived in London in 1867, which is very similar to the very similar to the instrument and in uh, the painting of Daras. And it is the oldest um, Tunisian instrument that arrived in London, thanks to Carl Engel collection, which was part of the Victoria Harbert uh, Museum collection first, and then now it is uh, in, part, in the collection of the Horniman Museum in London, collection of musical instrument. From what century? From 18th century, yeah, 1867. Yeah, it arrived in London. So, what, what we have another source very much related to this idea of Turkish Ottoman players, musicians. So we have officers at the military school of Bardo, just outside Tunis, which was created in 1840 by Ahmad Bey I. So those officers compiled a manuscript of Malouf compositions in Western musical notations titled Safain al-Malouf al-Tunis. So the boat, the guide, a metaphorical guide to Tunisian Malouf. And also a method of teaching musical instrument of Nubas and Malouf. So it was a method that was um, conceived for, for teachers that they had to teach to Arab Tunisian uh, military players. So both the military fanfare orchestration and the traditional ensemble used in 1872 this manuscript. So the manuscript contains a score, of course, in Western notation of several nubas. So the nuba zil, the mode zil, in the mode in, in the, the Tunisian mode, are, the Arab modes are called makam, makamat. In the, the, the Tunisian mode is, as a different name, is taba, tubua, as plural, and um, um, as a mean, meaning of temperament. Zil, Hassin, Nubain Ramal, Rasazil, Asbain, they're all names of modes. All, and the scores contain also the text and descriptions of the instruments, such as clarinet, piano, viol violin, rebab, and hoods. And I'm going to show you <laughs> some other contents of this. Um, Visible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So this is one of the uh, beginning pages. So you have this sort of uh, uh, kind of violin with, uh, with the tuning and uh, with, the, with the tuning, uh, in, with the Tunisian tuning actually, and which is paired with the, with the D, with the Re and, uh, and La and Re again and, and Sol, which is very close to the, to the Tunisian hood, also the, the Arab lute uh, tuning. And what is interesting is that you don't get the names of the, of the actual, the, the Arabic names of the actual notes. So for Re, you should have, uh, uh, for the first Re up there, you should have the name um, uh, Mahair. For the bottom uh, D, Re, you should have the name Duka. Instead, they, they actually say, they actually call uh, and write in, the, in Arabic the name as we, as, as, as Western, French, and uh, Italian were, were calling it, Re, uh, La, with, with the Arabic letters. Yes. And then some other descriptions of, uh, of it's actually a method of teaching the, 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 the music mm -hmm. to the, to the um, uh, to the military Tunisian, uh, Arab Tunisian. So you have a set of times and, uh, and the normal uh, uh, pairing with the, 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 viol, the Western violin paired next to the rabab, so the two fiddle rabab with the, with the same sort of tuning, uh, the, the D and, and the G again. Description of other Western uh, instrument on the right and on the on the left, uh, uh, drawing of the of the Tunisian lute again, paired with the with the with kind of uh, uh, fingering in the second image here, bottom left, the fingering of the of of, of the of the 
uh, on the frets of the uh, on the keyboard on the frets of the um, of the lute but also um, the text of the of the nubas on the right on the left and then uh, the starting of uh, of uh, uh, of the nuba the bite the the first the first trophic uh, part of the of the nuba on the on the right noted down in western um, notation so let me go back to this um, so what was the so uh, we have seen in detail more detail this manuscript but what was the, the 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 general context of this manuscript in 1872 so the manuscript originated in an era of modern tunisia which was rooted in and been understood as a secular modernizing statue due to the to its cosmopolitan construction during the 19th century so in particular in the reign of uh, muhammad the, the third al sadiq Tunisia issued the first constitution in the Arab world, inspired by the constitutional monarchies of Europe that was signed in 1861 and declared independence, Jewish independence. Ahmad Beya abolished, for example, the slave trade and ordered the end of slavery in 1846. And then, of course, the, the, as I said, the, the, the foundation of the Turkish military Bardo School in March 1840. Uh, so those um, highlighted moments of Tunisian modernity can be framed in what Makdizi defines as Ottoman Orientalism, in which the 19th century saw a fundamental shift from the early Turkish Empire paradigm into an imperial view suffused with nationalist modernization rooted in a discourse of progress. However, the passing from the empire to the protectorate, especially with the Treaty of Bardo in 12 May of 1881, set a line of demarcation on how Tunisian music was understood. So this shift makes us rethinking the Andalusian music heritage as Malouf by seeing it in a context of modernity and modernization previous to the colonial discourse and nationalist anxieties. So that is the painting that we saw before, and also the manuscript, the 1872 manuscript of Malouf school compiled by the militaries, were also in the hands of Ottoman Turkish players, at least, and belonging to this milieu of, of, of Tunisia. So to wrap up and to sum up and, and give some, start to give some uh, uh, conclusion, so the, the Safain al Malouf Tunis manuscript of transcription, in particular, afforded this repertoire the statue of com to compete with Western canons, but making it a permanent fixture in people's life. While Malouf had meant a more complex entity of forms, improvisation, social milieu, and cultural identities, as evidenced by the, the musical association activities. So the application of new sources, this this Safain al Malouf Tunis and other musical association during the protectorate often a new reading of music making during colonial time in Tunisia, which create both an opposite sense of revival, as if there was nothing before, and rethink the notion of classical music that Arab Andalusian music, Malouf in particular, carries. So modernity and colonialism are words and concepts of Western modernity. Both accepted in the discipline, so in social, social sciences and humanities, and the public sphere, so in mass media, social media, educated conversations, they were created in Europe because they were needed by examining the tension between French colons and Tunisian natives' public and intimate discourses. I introduce, and I borrow from, from Walter Mignolo, this, this idea of coloniality, which was actually not needed in Europe before. It was what European actors and, and, and institutions were, were really doing. So coloniality is a concept, is a decolonial concept, and equally decolonial is the compound modernity coloniality. So the compound is neither highlighting a contradiction nor a binary opposition. So both contradiction and binary opposition are interpretations controlled by the rhetoric and mindset of Western modernity. So coloniality, as a decolonial concept, breaks away from the spider web of Western modernity. 
And to conclude, I developed the concept of decoloniality from Mignolo as an antidote to the formalism of cultural colonialism rising in Tunisia since the French occupation, and as a form of struggle and survival against the colonial matrix of power. So my conclusion is that Tunisian musicians contributed significantly to a cultural resistance against colonial rule by employing publication to disseminate a musical reading of Tunisian self-determination. Thank you. Many thanks to Professor Mosa Mora for his uh, lecture, lecture with an extremely interesting perspective on, uh, on a musical reality and uh, musical exchange in the Mediterranean. And um, so we can start with our discussion. And uh, I invite all the audience to propose some oscillations, please. Thank you, Salvatore. Even though I'm uh, like Arlecchino, servitore di due padroni, so I missed the first part of your, I mean, <laughs> the whole of your intervention. But I, um, I would like to uh, ask you if, uh, uh, what do you think about the um, uh, the, uh, the reenactment of Malouf repertoire in uh, in in, in, the, in the nowadays uh, by some singers like Nabil Aman, uh, especially in Morocco? Um, so how Andalusian repertoire can be considered as a form of uh, uh, manifestation of uh, identity uh, out of uh, the colonial, decolonial uh, opposition? Thanks. Thank you. So this, this gives me the possibility to, to tell you that we, I showed the, at the beginning of this paper a, a small video of ethnographic uh, experience in Tunisia in 2015, showing the, the revival, the last revival, the 21st century revival. We had the revival in the, um, uh, during the, the end of 19th century, and, uh, and then we had the, 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 the foundation of the Rashidiya Institute in, uh, in 1935, and then, then, and then after that in the 60s, when there was try, they, when the government and Burkiba um, was trying to to develop a culture policy um, based on the, on the Arab music and of course uh, ele eleva elevated Malouf even more to the standard of uh, classical elite music uh, um, for uh, uh, for um, for the North Africa and for uh, for the Arab repertoire. There was the third. That had been the third in the 60s, third revival. What we have today is um, uh, the revival today has two phases and two perspectives. One is um, is the revival that the people in Tunisia and in Algeria and other places also uh, develop. So they have uh, they're more concentrated on on transforming the Malouf. Uh, and developing the Malouf through the improvisation and, and come going back to the teaching of through orality rather than musical scores. And that happens in the, in the actual country, so in, the, in Tunisia and Algeria. The, 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 the revivals that happen in the colonies, in France, from, from also from, 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 uh, from, uh, uh, from Tunisian who migrated uh, in several generations in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in France or Italy or um, also other places uh, in Europe, they, they tend to, uh, to be more close to, to the authentic and original score and manuscript, try, trying to keep uh, the original, uh, what, what they expect to be the original edited manuscript. And uh, so that, there is a contrast between these two perspectives because on one hand, um, um, the, 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 the Tunisian who lives in France, for example, they, they tend to uh, not to change the, 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 not to adapt and changing the lyrics, not to develop in a certain way the, 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 the music, which had a sort of uh, oral trans transmission um, um, pro 
process basically. And uh, while, while Indonesia is, is very much a part of the musical system, so they, they studied in the, in the, in the five uh, Institut Superior de Musique that they have in, in uh, spread around the country, and uh, to study, for them to study Malouf, to study this repertoire, means to study the musical system, so the, the, the modes and, and, uh, and how to develop their, their, their musical skills. Thanks. I don't know if that uh, is an overview of uh, what answer your questions. Thanks. Thank you. Are there interventions? Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Salvador. I mean, this was a fascinating topic, you know. Both because it enlarges, uh, you know, what is the scope and also the environment of music, especially in North Africa. Uh, I just want to say something. There's a friend of mine who lives in Tunisia right now, is the owner of a big company of uh, transportation so all across the North Africa. And he said that he sees right now a renaissance there, mm -hmm. despite many political issues that are obviously linked to the status of those Arab countries. What's your take now that you have deepened, you know, the, the, the study of this kind of uh, tradition in the past. So what do you think is projecting now in terms of historiography, in terms of ethnomusicology, in terms of studies, in the fields of studies right now in Tunisia? So what's going on? actually mm. right now yes yeah, so tunisian scholarship you mean correct uh, yeah yeah i mean that, that that's very that is very much developed um uh, it started with the uh, i quoted Mah mahmoud de Katat, who he, uh, who is considered the father of uh, of uh, tunisian musicologists because he the his generation and the, the generation after uh, they were studied in paris of course so they they went to do musicology in paris in the 70s and 80s so they went, they came back, Mahmoud Gattat, Murad Sakli, they came back to Tunisia and they founded the first um, uh, department of musicology, first in Tunis. Now we have five departments spread across Fax, uh, Susa, uh, Monastir, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, plus the, the, the actual musical conservatoire. But the, the actual department of, of academia and scholarship is um, then since the 70s has developed in this direction. And now we have three, four generations of younger students. Most of them, well, it's I still, I think it's still half and half. Some of them uh, who have the possibility go still and study uh, in, in Paris. So uh, they have this, um, of course, this French sort of. In a way, it is. I have to say, on the on the other side, there are also um, directors like uh, Hanis Med, Samir Besha, uh, and they did they, they work in the department of uh, musicology in Tunis, for example. And they they publish in Arabic, they write in Arabic, they and they they teach their musicology there, and they and also the center of Arab Mediterranean music, the the website I I showed the the, the recording. Um, they, they have uh, regular conferences to, where they also invite Western uh, Western scholars, but mainly is for uh, uh, promoting Tunisian music. But there is also in other Arab, Arab countries. You no, know, even Egypt has a, um, has an annual conference of Arab music only in Arabic, um, or they or they only invite Arab music. And uh, uh, which which is held in October actually, and this year was online, and, and it, it it is very much developed, and uh, they um, uh, and they don't actually want the perspective of ethnomusicologists to 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 talk and develop their 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 um, sources and their uh, their music because they 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 have the, they know they are musicologists so this this kind of paradigm which is actually not anymore neither in our western country I remember uh, studying the master in Cambridge where you you had a, a music studies course where you were ethnomusicology were at the same time in the same course with musicologists it's only a matter of uh, uh, methodologies and uh, sources, I think. Thank you for the question. It's very, 
It's very important to, to, un, to understand that on the other side uh, of the Mediterranean, in this case Mediterranean, but I'm sure on the other side of the world, musicology is very much uh, uh, developing. So and music. in these institutions, we normally have uh, two departments, uh, Department of Asian Music and Department of Western New Music, or which is the situation there? Okay, yeah. Uh, well, in Cairo, it was like this, and, and it's still like, like this. You know, they have two separate buildings, two separate departments of Western Music and uh, uh, Arab Music, Oriental Music. Um, in Tunisia, is um, it started to be like that also uh, recently, but it's, it's more concerned about uh, Arab Oriental music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the research is open. There are Tunisian researchers who study popular music in Mexico or uh, or Western music also. Yeah, in France. Yeah. Other observations, interventions. So we have to thank once more for this thank marvelous you. paper. Thank Thanks. you very much. <laughs> At this point, we are coming to the conclusion of the afternoon meeting. I, I would like to thank our three uh, speakers for the rich papers stimulating presentations, music, discussions, and many thanks to the audience for attention and interesting interventions. And pleasant evening to all of you. Uh, evening will, which will offer a wonderful concert too. To all of you, a further stimulating participation of the conference and uh, a pleasant real or virtual stay in Siena and its Academia Musicale Kicara. Buonasera.